Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 5 of the Brothers Karamazov, in the chapter entitled The Grand Inquisitor, Ivan Karamazov puts into that character's mouth a speech that he gives about how Christ could have made human beings happy but failed to do so, instead offering them a freedom that they can't really use in any correct way and how the Grand Inquisitor and his colleagues are going to fix that mistake. They're going to improve upon the divine plan. And it's framed in terms of the three temptations talked about in the gospel narrative, where Christ is out in the desert fasting for 40 days and nights. The devil comes to him and tempts him in three ways, all of which Christ rejects. The third and the, in, in some respect, most inclusive, the most encompassing of these temptations is that the, the devil shows him all of the kingdoms on earth and says, these can all be yours. And Christ rejects that. So the third temptation is a temptation about, you could say, rulership. And so... Here it's, it's framed largely in terms of, of that. The other two were framed slightly differently than the, the gospel narrative. It's not producing bread for yourself. It's producing bread for others. And then there's the whole discussion about miracle and mystery. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. You could rule or not rule. And there's a perennial problem if one doesn't take power when it's offered, somebody else is going to make use of that, or it will be an anarchy of people turning against each other. And that is, in fact, what the Grand Inquisitor says that Christ could have avoided, but chose not to. And so Christ could have provided for all of human needs. All of our needs, ranging from those of the bodily matters like food and hunger, all the way up to all of our spiritual needs as well. And so the Grand Inquisitor tells him, um, I have a secret to tell you. We're not with you, we're with, we're with him, the devil. That's our secret. For a long time, eight centuries already, we have not been with you, but with him exactly eight centuries ago, we took from him what you so indignantly rejected, the last gift he offered you when he showed you all the kingdoms of earth. We took Rome and the sword of Caesar from him and proclaimed ourselves sole rulers of the earth, the only rulers, though we have not yet succeeded in bringing our cause to its full conclusion. And bringing their cause to the full conclusion is what he's going to map out a little bit later. But we should ask ourselves, well, wait, wait a second, 800 years ago? What are we talking about? The Constantine was much earlier than that. And that's the usual reference point for Christians, is it not? When, you know, things went from being a nice, innocent, happy church to being under the rule of the terrible emperor. And, and there's a lot of, you know, nonsense there that, that has been uh, long since invented. And we don't have to worry about that. But we're, we're curious, though. Well, what, is, what happened 800 years earlier? This is in the... 1500s, so back it up about 700 years. What do we have? Charlemagne and the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. But wait a second. Who was in charge of the Holy Roman Empire? Wasn't it the emperor himself or was it the pope? And there were back and forth struggles throughout the rest of the Middle Ages over precisely that question. So you could say, well, maybe we're talking about a religious authority. Maybe we're talking about a political authority. Maybe we're talking about a fusion of both. Maybe we're talking about alliances. 
that doesn't matter so much. The point is that the church in this, this narrative here had become so intensely political and was looking not just for the spiritual benefits of the flock, but for other benefits instead. So what's going on here? He, he tells us that if you, you know, why did you reject this, this gift? Had you accepted that third counsel of the mighty spirit, you would have furnished all that human beings seek on earth. Someone to bow down to, someone to take over their conscience and a means for uniting everyone into something. Human beings want things to be universal, to have unity. Um, what would the result be? This is a very wonderful phrase. One common, concordant, incontestable anthill. Ants have been viewed as sort of the social creatures par excellence since the time of Aristotle, where he talked about them as being in some quasi sense political creatures in that they have organization, right? And if you think about an anthill, you don't get a lot of ants like carrying signs around saying, we want representation. No, they all do their business. And actually, the more that we know about ants, over the years through, through modern science, we, we know that they're in, in like one big hive mind in some respect, carrying out all of these things through chemical traces and genetics. And, you know, they're quite adaptable. There's very interesting things that happen with them. But they, you can't say that there's a lot of freedom in an anthill, right? So freedom has been taken away. And one common, one thing covering the entire earth. So instead of there being a number of different ant hills and ant colonies, one vast colony with everybody on the same page. This leads it to, to the concordant, right? What does it mean to have concord? That's harmony. That's everybody's wills being united or being compatible in a certain way. And then incontestable. That's an interesting phrase right there. There is no other earthly power that would be able to stand up against this. There's literally no other space to go to where you would raise a rebellion or carve out perhaps uh, a space of free thought that actually mattered for yourself. So he says the need for universal union is this third and last torment of human being. Mankind in its entirety has always yearned to arrange things so they must be universal. And he gives some interesting examples here. There have been many great nations with great histories. The higher these nations stood, the unhappier they were. Why? They were more strongly aware than others of the need for a universal union of mankind. Dostoevsky in his time gives the examples of great conquerors such as Tamerlane, Genghis Khan, right? We're looking at the Mongols and the Mongols did in fact control quite a vast empire. We could think of so many other world empires as well. We could think about things a little bit closer to our own time. Think about the Nazis and the wish to have a thousand year Reich that would eventually dominate the world. And were there, as in, you know, uh, science fiction and alternate history stories, other worlds for them to conquer, they would want to dominate those worlds as well. We could think about um, the Soviet Union and its attempt to, to control uh, as much as possible. We could think about America and its need to police nearly every corner of the world in the name of security. We can think of all sorts of examples of these universal empires, all of which end up disintegrating, falling apart, not making their people genuinely happy, even though they're striving after something that would make people happy. And he says that if Christ had accept Caesar's purple, that is rulership, he would have founded a universal kingdom and granted universal peace. And so we, we took Caesar's sword, and in taking it, of course, we rejected you and followed him, the devil. And he says, it's not all done right now. There's going to be centuries of problems, of, of in fact, horrors of freedom as this edifice of the Tower of Babel is rebuilt, as new kingdoms come and go and fight each other. He talks about there will be centuries of the lawlessness of free reason, 
of their science and anthro anthropophagy, right? Which means eating human beings, feasting on human beings, using human beings as meat. And he says, for having be begun to build their Tower of Babel without us, they will end in anthropophagy, right? And why is this the case? Well, there, there's really several different reasons. One is that the, you know, free reason, science, all that, that leads to technology, which is going to make things even deadlier, uh, create new possibilities. It's also the case that the Grand Inquisitor is looking ahead, and this is where, you know, a very existentialist text, the, you know, sciences were supposed to solve everything. And in the 19th century, there was this great dream that many people still have today in the 21st century, that, you know, if we just get scientific about things, all the problems of life will fall into place, and we'll get rid of all those silly old religious or metaphysical ideas, and we'll turn to just science by itself, and that will solve things for us. The name of that, by the way, is positivism. Started in the 19th century. Actually, it has its roots in the Enlightenment of the 18th century, and it's always been a crazy dream without any true basis in reality or history. As a matter of fact, history shows us the opposite of that, uh, as well as the fact that this, this trope gets repeated over and over again. Science, uh, free reason, do not actually lead us necessarily to the truth or to better social organization. As a matter of fact, for many people, they open up before us an abyss of unreason, of irrationality, of meaninglessness, of pure contingency that scares the living hell out of people. That makes them feel things like nausea, anxiety. This is typical existentialist ideas that are being enunciated here, right? In addition to this, he talks about the strong ones who will bring their strengths and their talents and their power of their spirit and ardor of their hearts to another field and end by raising their free banner against you, you being Christ. They won't just raise their free banner against Christ, though. These are the people who want to achieve something, who want to do something, maybe even to make human beings happy or to uh, deal with the sufferings, or to advance science. And their energies are going to lead them into doing things. And all this is going to produce conflict. All of this is going to produce meaninglessness. All of this is going to produce a situation in which the inquisitors, the church, whoever else is lined up with them as their colleagues, are going to have an opportunity. He says that after going through all of that, People are going to come to us and say, we want to be happy. And we'll convince them that they will only become free when they resign their freedom to us and submit to us. He says, they will be convinced we are right. They will remember to what horrors of slavery and confusion your freedom led them. Freedom, free reason and science will lead them into such a maze, confront them with such miracles and insoluble mysteries that some of them unruly and ferocious will exterminate themselves. Others unruly but feeble will exterminate each other. The remaining third, feeble and wretched, will crawl to our feet and cry out to us. Yes, you were right. Save us from ourselves. And that will be the time when the Grand Inquisitor and everything that he stands for is able to take over. A new regime will come into being. They will, in fact, have the power not only of Caesar, but of, a, you could say, a world empire and be able to, for the first time, make human beings happy. Bring all of them onto one page. Satisfy this desire for universality that has not been realized at any point in history. And that Christ, by assuming power in the third temptation, could, according to the Grand Inquisitor, have actually realized for humanity, but failed to do so. So when humanity gives up their freedom to the rulers or one rule or however you want to frame it, this new regime, they will then make human beings happy at the expense, of course, of freedom.